Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event, Launch and Learn event. We are delighted to have you here with us for this Launch and Learn event. Uh, as you know, we're going to talk about age tech, the technology for the elder adults. And um, we are delighted to hosting this in collaboration with South Florida HIM. So thank you for giving us the opportunity. Um, of course, we have a very uh, knowledgeable experts here that we are going to learn from them. Uh, Dr. Eric Eliyev, Dr. Puyan, Dr. Pandia, and Dr. Min Chen. Uh, you're going to learn from uh, their background and experiences in a few minutes. Before we get into the program, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk a little about our Master of Health Informatics and Analytics program here at FIU. I am Tala Mirzai, the uh, Associate Professor and the Faculty Director for the program. And um, uh, as you probably already know, this is the healthcare technology is a very hot topic, especially for the elder adults, a very hot topic in South Florida and in the entire nation. And what we are doing here with our Master of Health Informatics program is trying to bridge that gap between academia and the industry training experts who can join the workforce and um, bring all the skills that they learn during their master's program into the industry and helping the, uh, the healthcare uh, industry out there. What we are offering is a fully online program. It's a cohort based. We have a, a group of faculty who are uh, world-renowned, their research is world-renowned, and we are fully accredited by KHAM, and we are very happy to be uh, approved educational partner with HIMS uh, as well. And we are very strategically located in the College of Business, so we are bringing the healthcare information technology in addition to business and analytics. Our Alumni is probably your colleagues. Uh, yeah, you probably know them from your uh, industry. Some of them are listed uh, here that you can see, and we are looking forward to generate more experts, of course. Uh, in addition to the full program that we are offering, we have two joint programs. One is with the College of Medicine, so MD, MS, HIA degree, uh, where it's like a combined short uh, term uh, degree where the uh, medicine students can join us in the fourth year, get uh, learn about the technology and, and leverage that uh, as they are joining the job market. We are also offering another combined degree with healthcare MBA program that we have here at FIU. And so this way we are generating more uh, executives in the leadership positions. Uh, healthcare MBA is sponsoring this event as well. So thank you, thank you Healthcare MBA uh, uh, for uh, sponsoring this event with us. And I like to invite you, all the experts here, our students need you. Our students can learn a lot about, from your expertise and your knowledge out there and your time would be very beneficial for them. It doesn't take, our mentorship program doesn't take a lot of time from you during the 15 months that they are with us. Maybe they have a couple of touch points uh, with you. So, um, but it can change the life of the career life of a student. So please join us and mentor our students uh, if you wish to. To do so, uh, check our website, mshia.fiu.edu, or you can email us, mshia.fiu.edu, and a phone number is also there. I'll be very happy to talk with any of you who are interested in this any further from here. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to now pass it to the president of South Florida Hymns, uh, Kendall Brown, to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Tala, and thank you. Uh, she did not acknowledge herself as being a board member of our organization, and she's been instrumental to our board, so thank you, Tala. Uh, there's a number of other board members from South Florida Hymns in the room, if you wouldn't mind standing, because we are all volunteers, and it does take an army 
for us to put together events like this. So um, please uh, approach any of us if you want to know more about South Florida Hymns, uh, the organization, our local chapter. Uh, we have about 2,000 members. Uh, we're very close to that number, and as a personal and chapter goal to uh, achieve 2,000 members. So please, if you're students or professors, um, FIU is an organizational affiliate of HIMS, and uh, that does include some memberships, but as a student, uh, it's a very nominal fee to become a, st uh, a member of South Florida HIMS. So we welcome all. Um, this is our first in-person event of the year. Uh, the HIMS calendar year starts uh, and follow follows the school calendar year, so we just started our year in June, and we'll wrap it up in May. So we're very happy to be here in person. Uh, and this is the second event that we've done in person in about two years due to COVID. So we're very, very excited to have everyone here today and be here today and, and in person and together. If you're not familiar with HIMSS, it's a, an acronym, Health Information Management System Society. It's an international organization uh, within the North American continent, uh, Canada and United States. Um, there are about 50,000 members, um, and then globally, I'm not sure what the number is, but uh, it is an international organization. It's very widely known, high caliber health IT professionals and uh, educational topics that surround health IT. The vision and mission uh, is to realize full health potential for every human everywhere. Um, and to reform, uh, reform the global health ecosystem through the power of information and technology. And some of those things we're here to talk about today. If you want to stay in touch with us, I encourage you to get off your phone and scan that QR code. It will take you to um, our, I believe our, uh, you can opt in to our text message capabilities um, where we can text you about some of our, and we promise not to, to inundate you too much. Um, you can also follow us on all the social media platforms. We do have a website as well. And we also need volunteers like yourselves to help us uh, keep programs like the one that we're here today doing. Um, it takes an army of effort to provide these types of things, and we need uh, volunteers. There's lots of ways to get involved. Again, approach myself or any of the board members to learn more. Our annual conference where... Uh, about 50,000 people uh, attend. Uh, this year is in, in Chicago, or I'm sorry, 2023 will be t uh, Chicago. Um, it's oftentimes in Orlando, if anybody was uh, or has been to our national conference in Orlando. Uh, we had our national conference in Orlando at the beginning of this year, and uh, South Florida Hymns chapter coupled with Central North Florida Hymns chapter and we put together a party on the exhibit hall floor. It was Miami Vice themed one year, um, and we had about 300 people attend this last one. So quite the representation. If you do make it to Chicago, um, I'm sure we'll be doing something, and we invite all of the members in South Florida to come uh, and, and represent with us. Some announcements, and these are hot off of the press. Some of them aren't even on our website. Um, uh, the date for the first one is incorrect. It's October 17th, Thursday. We are doing a more Meet the Board uh, networker. Uh, so the first networker that we've been able to hold since before COVID. So we invite everybody, maybe jump on Brightline or Carpool, come up and, uh, and, and join us at the Fitz Bar. Uh, it's a pure social uh, and networking event. So, uh, Global Health Equity Week is October 24th through the 28th. Uh, South Florida HIMS put together a mentorship mentee program uh, this last summer, and uh, we'll be doing a webinar during that week to talk to uh, all of the HIMS chapters across the nation about our success with the mentor mentee program. Uh, so get in, uh, stay in, stay in, tune, in touch with uh, South Florida HIMS so to learn more about Global Health Equity Week. Um, and then we're very, very excited to host our annual conference. It's a mini HIMSS national, if you will, here for our local South Floridians. 
Uh, we call it Integrate. It will be our 11th year doing this annual conference. About 300 health IT professionals, students, vendors, professors, doctors, CIOs, VPs, uh, will all be in attendance. Uh, so I encourage you to um, attend. We already have a few people slated, high caliber health IT professionals uh, to speak. Uh, one is Patrick Vail, the CIO of VITAS. We have the Chief Diversity Officer from Memorial Healthcare, uh, Oscar Perez from Health Choice Network, and there's a whole laundry list of others that we won't spoil. But uh, it is a, a very knowledgeable day-long conference. Uh, I encourage everyone to help um, uh, help uh, advertise the, uh, the, the event and attend as well. Uh, it is a day-long, um, fun day of educating on health IT professionals. We couldn't do things like this without our, the, the sponsorship of organizational affiliates like FIU. Uh, so we want to take a moment to recognize our OAs, as we call them, uh, as well as our annual sponsors. Um, you know, the, the sponsorship dollars from our annual sponsors help us put together events like this and provide the food that you're eating. So um, thank you to our sponsors and our OAs for hosting us. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Eric. Uh, Dr. Eric has um, been very instrumental in not only helping plan today's event, but uh, a new, a new uh, uh, resource for our programs committee. So thank you, Dr. Eric. He's very knowledgeable on age tech, uh, which we're here to hear, uh, here to hear today to hear about. Uh, he's also uh, the CEO of iConnect.io, which is a robotic process automation patient engagement application. I encourage you to ask him about that tool. And he's also the former um, CEO and owner of Home Healthcare Organization out of New York. Uh, so he's very knowledgeable in technology and elder care, which is why we are here today to, and to listen to this, this uh, important topic. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eric. He's going to introduce the rest of our panelists. Thank you again for being here, and uh, I look forward to networking with all of you. OK. How is everybody doing today? Come on, guys. This is Miami. This is Hims. We're at FIU. How's everybody doing today? There you go. That's the energy. So today we're going to be speaking about age tech, right? Age tech. And let's first define what is age tech, right? What is it? So according to Ed Karen Etkin, who wrote a book called The Age Tech Revolution. Age Tech is a term used to describe digital technology that's built around the needs and wants of who? Of older adults. And those who care for them, preferably those who care for them, including them in the design process, right? All right. So a little bit of, a little bit of let's turn this way, a little bit of, of, of data. Look at this graph over here. The US population aged 65 and over is projected to increase from 54 to 94.7 million by 2060. That's a lot of elderly folks who we're gonna need to take care of. And so why is all this important? If you think about it, why is age tech important? We know there's a silver tsunami grant, as you always say, that's coming, right? Why is all this important? Let me share with you a story. You guys all know Blockbuster over there, right? How many of you guys remember Blockbuster, right? So there's a book that's called That Will Never Work, all right? And the book has a story in it where a CEO of a new startup, he comes to this big CEO of a huge organization such as Blockbuster. True story, and he says, listen, this VHS thing, the DVD thing, the renting, that's gonna go away, that's gonna dissolve. We should instead, and I'm talking to you as the big CEO, we should instead do streaming. 
That's where the future is. Things are going to be in the cloud. And the big CEO, right, in this nice leather chair was sitting and he said, that will never happen. That will never happen. Now, how many of you guys knows how many blockbusters were there around? Grant, want to take a guess? 9,000. You're close. 9,000. How many are active today? One. In Oregon, I believe. One. Right? So that will never happen. And as we all know, that company is Netflix and Hulu and all the other streaming. I once heard Oprah say something very, very cool. And, and I use that a lot when I teach my students and I, and I give lectures and keynotes. I say that. She says something beautiful. If you don't evolve, then you will dissolve. dissolve. If you don't evolve, then you will dissolve. So that is why this is so important for all of us here today. And we're kind of battling it out. It's the past versus the future, right? And the present even. In healthcare, we're still in the, kind of in the blockbuster world, right? But there's good news on the horizon. And I want to, as I start to talk about HTEC, I want to tell you two stories. One about Harry and one about Michael. You guys ready? Let's go. So let's meet Harry. Very happy looking individual in his 80s. I like his style, has a nice hat. At 9 o'clock one day, he starts to feel really, really bad. Actually, he's not feeling well for seven days. He has a cough, he has a fever, some shortness of breath, and he thought he can get over it. But what happened was, it didn't get better. So at 9 o'clock, he calls his PCP. 9 p.m. The PCP picks up from the service, says, Harry, look, I don't know how to help you, man. You know, I, I don't have the resources to come and take care of you at the home right now. You got to go to the hospital. So call 911. 911 ambulance comes. And Harry is laying in this cold emergency room. And there are nurses and doctors and going back and forth. And he's saying, hey, can, can anybody help me, please? Anybody help me? Finally, someone comes to them, right? And no offense to the great hospital systems here. Uh, so, uh, finally, um, and, and big shout out to Ganesh which is a great hospital system. Somebody finally comes to, to his help. They do a chest x-ray. And Dr. Pandey, as you see on the slide, they find a consolidation and pneumonia. OK, you have a pneumonia. You have some sepsis. Your blood pressure is no good. We got to put you on IV antibiotics. All right, IV antibiotics. But now Harry's you know, deconditioned. He's laying in the bed, and he's not really moving around. So look, you can't get up to go to the bathroom. Let's put in a Foley. A Foley catheter, so you can urinate. OK. Put in a Foley catheter. Time goes on, time goes on. He's on antibiotics, but now he's developed a UTI, which is resistant to the antibiotics that he's already on. OK. Then what? More antibiotics. All right. OK. Oh, uh, now Harry's been laying in the bed, hospital busy. He's laying in one position, not turning left or right. What does Harry develop? A decubitus ulcer, a pressure ulcer, right? Now look at the hat here, look at the hat here, and look at Harry. Look at look how sad he is. He's in a wheelchair. He's going to go home, but before he goes home, he needs to go to rehab. Before he goes to rehab, you know, he needs some wound care. The total cost of care for a DRG, and there are different numbers, we know there are transparency issues, is about 12 grand for one patient for a pneumonia. That's just minimum. That's, I'm understating it. it. It ends up being so much more, right? That's blockbuster. And don't even think about just, oh, this is, you know, the, the, you know, there's the money aspect. Think about what happened to Harry. My grandmother could be a Harry. My grandfather could be a Harry. Your mom and dad could be Harry's, right? Now, I also want to now introduce you to my good friend, Michael. Right? Now, Michael, let's see if I could get the, let's see if I press play, would it work? Oh, no, let's see, one sec. A second of commercial break. Okay.
I'm actually going to play this. Let's see. So Michael actually, his home is an H-Tech home. It's a smart home. And Michael has a device, and it's connected to 4G, and you have all these different data points, the blood pressure, the pulse oximeter, the thermometer, the scale, the glucometer. Everything is in Michael's home. OK. So Michael actually, on day two, he starts not feeling well. Same cough, a little bit of fever, a little bit of green sputum production, a little bit. But what happens, because of a smart home, Michael's oxygen level, pulse rate, skin temperature, blood pressure, all of that is automatically relayed to a command center. The command center is running clinical decision support systems. And in the trigger, ding, 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 ding. Oh, look at that heart rate. It's 107. Hmm, look at the pulse ox. It's dropping. What happens then? It triggers a care coordinator to call Michael. Michael, how are you? Uh, you know, for two days, I haven't been feeling well. Mike, let me do this for you. Let me have a telemedicine visit for you and Dr. Smith. Okay. But now let me ask you something, Grant. Can I listen to your lungs using your phone and just looking at you and talking to you? No, not yet. If I take your cell phone, right? I just take this and I'm talking to him. Telemedicine. Grant, how are you? Good. Can you take a deep breath from me? It ain't going to work. So with the world of H-Tech, right, with a Netflix, there are actually devices around today that Dr. Smith can tell Michael, hey, just put this device right on your lungs, right on your heart, take a deep breath from me. And in real time, even though I'm in Paris next to the Eiffel Tower, in real time, I can listen to your lungs. Right? That's like a wow moment. Let me hear everything say it. Wow. Right? Now, listen to the lungs. He thinks he needs a chest x-ray just to confirm. He prescribes an antibiotic. Michael gets an antibiotic. But there's something else. Does Dr. Smith know everything? No. We're humans. We're doctors, but we're humans. When he prescribes the antibiotic, Dr. Smith forgot that on Michael's previous lab work, Dr. Pandya, the creatinine clearance started getting worse. And it got out of his head. He forgot. No worries. We're in the Netflix. There's the clinical decision support system. What did it do? It actually went into the EHR by itself. It took the dose of the amoxicillin or the fluoroquinolone, and it said, Hold up, let me, let me round it up and let me see what the creatinine clearance is by itself. And then it said, ding, 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 it sends a message to Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, you should lower the dose of the Leviquin. Not 500 every day, but 250 every other day because of the creatinine clearance. That's another wow moment, right? Now, true story. I had one of the largest house call practices in New York. We had over 20 nurse practitioners. We underwent a merger and acquisition in 21, in March of 21, to a large direct contact en entity. I had a patient who was seen, actually, by another doctor from another house call organization. This story actually happened. He didn't know the creatinine clearance, gave Leviquin a higher dose than needed, and the patient ended up in the hospital with massive renal failure. Actually passed away because she de declined dialysis. That's when I say wow moment because these things can and will change people's lives. That grandmother who passed away, she didn't get to see another bar mitzvah or wedding. Because of that medication, that could be prevented with clinical decision support. Now it gets even better. It gets even better. I can give you the medication, right? So at the, I can give you the medication, but how do I actually know you're taking it? In doing house calls, I used to go to folks' homes and open up the closet and would see bags and bags of medications. So doctors would prescribe him, but the meds wouldn't be taken. Now there's a lot of issues to that. Number one, some of those meds are very, very expensive. So what's the point of prescribing them if someone's going to be like, I'm not going to take it, right? So 
there are HTEC products out there. This is a cap. It's universal. It actually attaches to your bottle, to your medication bottle. It, it matches it. And every time you unscrew it, there's a message sent to the platform that you've unscrewed it and that you're actually, at least you've opened it. Now, I don't know if you took it. You may be saying, hey, doc. Uh, um, uh, right? And I won't even know. But at least I know that someone has opened it. Now, in the future with HTEC, there will be medications that are actually biometrics and actually send those signals. There will be, right? And like Steve Jobs used to say, one more thing, right? One more thing. Michael, he's at home, but he's a little weaker, right? He's a little weaker. So what Michael actually has is like a CO2 detector looking device. It's a non-wearable, non-invasive radar, AI, and ML device that tracks his location, his motion, his respiration. And look at Michael. He's walking up. Ooh, he fell. If he fell automatically, that fall will be reported in a platform to his health care provider. That, my friends and my colleagues, is the medicine of the future. That is the Netflix. And that is what we're working on tirelessly to build and to develop. Some of the ecosystem. This is the age tech ecosystem. I know many of these companies, and we work with them, this is just in 22, startups that focus on age tech. Look at all these. Woo. You've got for senior living, wellness, smart home, variables, fall prevention, independence, cognitive, hospice, financial wellness. You name it, it's there. Now, are all of them going to be successful? And No, but there's a lot. And, but why? Why is everyone going into this? Well, let's look at Apple, Amazon, and other big tech companies. Why are they in it? This longevity economy is a $15 trillion economy. And just to show you, Oracle, June 7, 2022, Oracle was never into healthcare. They just bought Cerner, which many of you folks know is one of the largest EHRs, for 20, if you like the lotto guy, for $28 billion. $28 billion. CVS just bought, this is fresh off the press, September 5th, just bought Signify Health, which is actually a home health, um, a prac a home health uh, product with uh, AI and all sorts of things for $8 billion. Amazon bought one medical for $3.9 billion. So we're going to get to the age tech future very, 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 very soon. I like this. I always mention this to my medical students uh, back in New York. And this is for some of the students here with us today. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by the dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most importantly, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become, for everything else is secondary. And I know I spoke to some of the students here today. Take this to heart. This really, really matters. So with that, my friends, I conclude the keynote, and we're going to transition now. We have folks here with us. I gave you the high-level overview, the beautiful sales pitch. But the work that goes on day in and in and day out on the field from a clinical perspective, from a research perspective, these are some of the respected speakers here with us today. We have Dr. Min Chen, who is the Associate Professor of FI, in FIU Business, and you'll introduce yourself in a bit. Dr. Puyan, also the Assistant Professor here at FIU, and you'll talk about some of your great work, and you'll do an introduction. And Dr. Pandya, who's the Chair of Geriatrics for Nova Southeastern University. Before I start, can we give a nice, warm round of applause for our panelists? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the panelists. If you can, within 30 to 60 seconds, introduce yourself, your role, and a little bit of your bio. Dr. Chen. Uh, sure. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Ming Chen. I'm an associate professor here at FIU Business. Um, my research focused on innovative solutions to disrupt the iron triangle in healthcare. That is access, cost, and quality. Um, I was always keen to um, solve those uh, challenging real world problems. So after I got my master's in public policy and then PhD from the Kellogg School of Management, I went to join a leading economic consulting firm, uh, working with various stakeholders on those challenging healthcare cases like antitrust, class action cases. Um, through, my, if, if, through my consulting experience, I realized that my true passion still lies in research and teaching. That's why I joined the Panther family happily. What I also realized is that there's this inherent trade-offs among the cost, quality, and access. We can try hard to improve one or even two of these three dimensions, but it's really hard to you know, overhaul all three. Uh, often comes at the price of the third. Um, I believe that Innovations such as um, health IT and artificial intelligence hold the promise to break this iron triangle. That's why I focus my research on studying both the intended and unintended consequences of these innovations and uh, never looked back. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, that was wonderful. Dr. Pandya. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be on this campus. Um, so I'm chair of geriatrics at uh, NSU uh, Kiran Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm also a board-certified internist and endocrinologist, and um, I have a wonderful job in that I can see patients for part of my week. Uh, I can teach, and I also direct a geriatrics workforce enhancement grant. That's a federal grant to geriatricize the workforce, which um, uh, we're struggling to do. Um, I've had a lot of experience in primary care, in the long-term care setting, and in the academic setting. So I uh, feel that I'm still somebody who's from the trenches. I've done a lot of my work and research on diabetes in older adults and uh, developing clinical practice guidelines with AMDA, Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care, the American Diabetes Association. And uh, now I'm on an advisory committee for Health and Human Services on interdisciplinary and community-based linkages. Um, I try not to ask my kids too much assistance for technology. <laughs> I, I try to do it myself because I think, hell, you know, I have to be able to do this. Uh, and uh, I should be able to do this with my education. So I try not to fear technology. Uh, try to incorporate it in my life with the help of friends and colleagues. And um, I agree with you. I think that innovation and uh, reimagining what the care of older adults can be is important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandya. Dr. Puyan. I'm sorry. That's a technology problem. <laughs> <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, really, thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's really my great pleasure. So uh, as he said, so my name is uh, Puyan Smaizadeh, so I'm an assistant professor in information system and business analytics here at uh, College of Business, FIU. So a little background about myself, I have engineering uh, background, so I'm, uh, I work in different international companies in different also countries, in different type of field, oil, uh, petroleum, advertising, uh, like marketing, healthcare, and uh, designing programs, designing apps, designing fitness apps, so some of the fitness apps that maybe you use, and uh, designing clinical distance support system, designing a health information exchange platform, and using blockchain in healthcare, blockchain-based HIE. And, uh, and there are some other projects. So I, I really uh, into uh, innovation in healthcare. That's my field for at least like around 15 years. And I really like all these uh, innovative uh, solutions for different types of population, especially we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about seniors and also age tech, and the different types of project, innovative project gonna 
help them uh, have a better, healthier, and also happier life. I, I think it's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puyan. So let's get into the meat, the nuts and bolts. And I'm going to ask the panelists some really interesting and thorough questions. Dr. Pandya, I'd like to start from you. I know that from an age tech perspective, CMS is really promoting remote patient monitoring, really trying to promote it. What are some of the challenges? First of all, like what is RPM in essence to you as a clinician? Right? How do you use it? What uh, case applications? And what are some of the challenges you see both on the provider end and also on the patient side regarding adaptation of it? Right. So I think adapt, um, remote patient monitoring is a fragmented um, mode of care. It's available in some pockets. Um, in our practice and in our university, we're not using uh, data from other platforms that are monitoring patients remotely, unfortunately. We are doing a lot of telemedicine from the beginning of the pandemic, so I think we've acquired a lot of skills in uh, monitoring our patients there. And um, what we have done is um, now we can integrate at least continuous glucose monitors for patients with diabetes. And older adults with diabetes are some of the sickest and most frail uh, members of our community. So we can at least integrate that data. Uh, what you showed in your slides, an idealized version of monitoring blood pressure, uh, respirations, even sleep, mobility, um, I think there are pockets of uh, you know, care that is uh, carried out in this fashion. But the problem I see is integration with existing um, electronic health records, existing documentation systems in practice. So does the practice have this uh, capability or are they getting it from another agency? So communication and integration into the e EHR is very important. Uh, various home healthcare companies who are ideally suited to be the interface um, come and go. Their staffing is poor. Their use of technology is low right now. So where they could really be the glue that could improve the care of older adults, it's really not happening to the extent that we would hope. And so there is still um, what I call fragmentation of care a lot of uh, mishaps, uh, gaps in information. Uh, you know, so elders often resort to uh, going to the emergency room or the nearest urgent care. You mentioned the PCP picked up a call. Uh, patients always surprised when I call them in the evening, but it's, uh, you know, we do have a fail-safe system of you can't call us at any time, but the fundamental problem is still a lack of access to care. Thank you, Dr. Pandya. Um, Dr. Puyan, we just heard from Dr. Pandya regarding some of the challenges with the adoption of these new technologies. And I know that you have done significant research regarding adoption of these technologies, and in the elderly and in the age tech. So we heard from Dr. Pandya from a clinical perspective in the field. I'm really interested to see what the research shows that you've done as well and how it aligns. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, question because, uh, you know, you may have advanced technology, but they use it, for example, for one month, and after that, they just abandon it. So that's it. So they use it, for example, my grandma, you're going to use it, for example, the tablet or the advanced technology for just uh, remote controlling, but only for one month, and after that, nothing. So why? There are lots of issues. So one of them, lack of trust. Because this type of technology is just kind of bl uh, like a black box for them. So just let's have one uh, simple example I'm going to ask you guys. So you have different options. For example, you have gas car, you have electric car, you have autonomous car. How many of you guys are going to pick autonomous car now? Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And why? <laughs> lack of trust, lack of knowledge, right? Because you don't know what is it. So you don't know if there's any malfunction. Who gonna answer to this question that, okay, what gonna do after that? So if I have robot and the robot gonna, gonna tell you, hey, you, have bi you, are, you are bipolar. The robot gonna tell you you are bipolar. And <laughs> how, many gonna, how many of you guys are gonna accept it? No. <laughs> Who said that? And what kind of algorithm are gonna use it? So I don't know. It's completely black box, so it's lack of knowledge. 
So we're going to, for example, tell my grandma, hey, my grandma, there is a, there is a very nice technology. Please use it. And the, the technology is going to say that you got cancer. You got cancer. I, I'm not. So <laughs> why? Because of lack of knowledge. Huh? This, is, this is the issue. So the lack of trust, lack of knowledge. And, and the other one that I want to just also emphasize, because I have it in my, in my research, is that regulation is always far, 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 far away from technology. So if I have robot and I'm just going to tell you what to do after that, so there is a malfunction, who's going to answer that? Me as a designer, healthcare provider, uh, the, the, for example, uh, hospital manager? I don't know, because there is no clear answer to that. There are some FDR, for example, regulations, for example, for machine learning, but it's not even clear. You can Google it and answer this question. Who's going to take that responsibility? So these are some of the main things that we can we can talk about, and I, I think we're going to just, uh, right. just after that, we're going to talk about Bef more. So we, before we shift gears uh, to AI and Dr. Chen, I'll ask you, I wanted to ask Dr. Pandya, what, do what are your thoughts on what Dr. Puyan just said? Yeah, I, I feel I still have job security. <laughs> 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 because I, I think Not your with me. patients, uh, myself included, I need a real person to talk to. I think the technology, Google, um, AI, um, other modes of diagnosis still need to synergize with a clinician. My patients still get, you know, have access to all this, get tests. They even go to other countries and get full body PET scanned. You know, they do everything. But then they come to me and say, what should I do? What do you think? Um, so I perhaps, I, actually I make no apologies for this. I don't think it's old fashioned. I think physicians should still be hands on, be able to talk, to touch, uh, to explain, and in the end, to hold your hand when you're dying. Thank you, Dr. Pan. Yeah. Dr. Chen, uh, did you want to chime in on this oh, as yeah, well? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly double down on Dr. Pandya's idea. <laughs> um, I think people always talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I would like to talk about, like, you know, augmented intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, the machines are going to be replacing clinicians, but it's more like providing a decision support, like a supporting role. And the final decision will still be in the hands of the, you know, physician, uh, clinician, and patients. It's a joint, like, shared decision-making process. Um, but, of course, you know, the public policy is still quite lacking behind, you know, uh, the ethical considerations, the data breach concerns, because once the data are shared, they can be unshared. Once your DNA is uh, genome sequence being reviewed, it can be unreviewed. So how can we really, you know, deal with all these considerations is also some of those uh, unintended consequences may be caused by AI and also, you know, other innovative solutions. Thank you. So I've heard a couple of times AI, machine learning, and I know, Dr. Chen, that you've done some research and applications um, where it doesn't replace the physician, but it augments, I like that term, augmented um, intelligence. I've never heard that before. That's beautiful. So can you share some of your research and case uses on that? Um, sure, yeah, so um, AI and the machine learning is a branch of AI has been widely applied in, you know, disease detection, diagnosis. So one of my recent projects is a collaboration with researchers from Carnegie Mellon University. So we developed a machine learning enabled decision support system to um, distinguish stroke patients from stroke mimic patients when they show up in the ER. So in the slides, uh, Dr. Eric showed about the person, Michael. Yep. So I'll just take that as an example. So when, suppose Michael live in a rural area with you know, limited access to those you know, advanced and expensive diagnostic testing like MRIs in time. And then one day, Michael started to feel you know, um, like weak, enhanced, lax, and you know, it's hard to really speak. So Michael you know, showed up in the ER. And at this point, because you know, it's a small rural hospital, it's under-resourced and understaffed. It doesn't really have quick access to those advanced diagnostics tools. Uh, and then, you know, also doesn't have in-house neurologists. So what did you do in your research? Uh, right. What kind so, of experiment did you? So basically what we do is that um, 
once the patient show up in the ER, uh -huh. um, often initial tri triage by the nurses, uh, we use like natural language processing to transcribe all those notes and integrate it into EHR combined with those um, patients' previous medical history, like existing data, and then all those information were fed into a pre-trained, best-performing machine learning model. So that was based on a lot of like you know, patterns, like discovered patterns, and then it's going to send us alert to show if this patient is a uh, high risk for stroke or not. Then those ER care teams can focus their resources on those high risk patients. And, and one last thing, when you compared the specificities of, of what you're doing and what, if that wouldn't be there, what did you find? How oh, accurate? A, yeah, that's a great question. So we actually use data, retrospective data, uh, from all the patients, uh, stroke and stroke mimic patients discharged from all hospitals all Florida hospitals, so that's like over 50,000 records. Uh, we use that to train our machine learning model, and the sensitivity can be up to 96 to 97 percent. Wow, so 96 that's a, to 97 percent. Yeah, substantial improvement over those commonly used pre-hospital scales, which is at the 60 to 70 percent. Um, but we are still working on improving the specificity, which is the false negative rate. I see. So those physicians, like clinicians, won't be you know burdened by those false uh, positive you know alerts. Thank you. And and since we're on the topic of uh, AI and machine learning, Dr. Puyan, I know you have a lot of experience in that field as well. Uh, what are some of your experiences in research? If, when it comes to AI and, and machine learning. I mean, to be honest, I don't, so I think a lot of us don't even know the, the difference. Like, what's AI? What's machine learning? What's deep learning? I mean, it all sounds the same to me. Uh, okay, I don't want to uh, uh, bore you with some, like, technical Give things. Give us the but, Cliff Notes version. But let's just start with the, some easy things. So, uh, around, around, like, for example, uh, late 80s, so we have something is called knowledge-based clinical decision support system. So what does that mean? So it means that someone like me, for example, is try to... Uh, for example, use rule-based uh, algorithm. If you have this sign and symptom, then you are diagnosed with this, right? So it means someone should understand medicine and also information technology in order to qualify all the medical literature. So you can understand that how difficult it is because line by line, you can qualify all the medical literature. And this is something that I did actually. This is, this is one of our projects in 2008. So, uh, and now that's why I know some kind of medicine too. So uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the startup clinical decision support system. It's knowledge-based. It means it's still, it just depends. All the decision-making, all the things is depending on what? Medical literature. But now we have non-knowledge-based clinical decision support system. We are using different types of, for example, algorithm, genetic algorithm, neural, artificial neural networking, or for example, machine learning. So I know it's kind of like, uh, difficult to understand the differences, but let's just let's just start with uh, with easy things. So, so we have something it's called like machine learning. So machine learning is not pattern recognition, right? So it means, uh, for example, algorithm or medical algorithm try to understand and analyze millions of the records in order to understand the pattern, mm -hmm. right? And then for the new patient, it's just what the machine gonna do train itself. So for the new patient, it's try to compare with that pattern. So guess what it is? There is no medical literature. It's only pattern recognition. It's only pattern recognition. So it's only just machine that thinks and trains. So you know what the difficulty is? So the machine should train. And when machine should train, you need data. So the quality of data matters. If the quality of data is not OK, if you have some wrong, or for example, outdated data that is very important in healthcare, and lots of EHR have, has, have like just stored lots of outdated data, I can say that. So this is one of the problems. So if the, if the data is outdated, is not valid, is not reliable, the pattern is wrong, the decision making is wrong, and what is the end? Death. And that's actually, <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually a nice way of putting it. It, it. Because if you think about it, in business we have garbage in, garbage out, right? Right, but okay. So my 
you know, my income statement has some wrong data. All right, maybe, you know, my numbers will be off and I didn't make money or I lost money. That's fine. I could live with that, let's say. But you're right. If the data that's inside, and then you have AI and machine learning leveraging data that's not accurate, making decisions of that data on human beings, like you so eloquently said, then you just die. <laughs> to be very uh, honest, definitely, if the data is wrong, so everything is wrong. So we live in a, in a, in a era of pattern. Why Amazon is successful? Pattern. Why Netflix is successful? Pattern. So it's just pattern recognition. They just want to understand who you are. What are your likes, what you don't like, what, you, what are your barriers, what are your problems, what are... So exactly the same thing in healthcare. So we just want to understand your personal issues and also your background and also some other factors in order to give you some personalized, tailored care planning. This is what you need. So because this is the difference between mass marketing and personalized marketing. Now is not mass marketing in healthcare. It's impossible. So you cannot have the same, for example, care planning or treatment option for everyone. Right. So you, it's impossible. It's not like Starbucks, right? Like, Where you get the same. It's not that simple. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Puyan. Um, Dr. Pandya, shifting gears a little bit. I'm going to read. It says here that according to a 2020 AARP report, 53 million Americans are currently serving as unpaid caregivers, right? And we know with the silver tsunami that there's, and in general, we don't have enough people to take care of our elderly. Are there any other countries that are using some innovative technologies to take care of this real issue? Thank you. I I think we first have to look at what's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, and in this country, that's billions of dollars of unpaid uh, care uh, that is happening. And caregivers' health suffers, their mental health, their physical health suffers because of their caregiver duties. Um, so just on a local level in uh, Florida, there is something called NAN care. It's what is that called? A NAN care. NAN care. Um, it's, uh, uh, supported by the Department of Elder Affairs, and it's a grant uh, project. Um, but anybody can be referred, any older adult can be referred uh, there, and this team uh, will assess their needs and provide them resources where they can go in their community, because that's a really part of the problem, is where to go. I mean, I have very affluent patients, well-insured patients who are struggling where to find resources to pr meet their care needs, whether it's medical care, equipment, you know, sp special therapies. Um, so th it's not adequate. Then the area agencies on aging and health departments can also be resources. But as far as technology, um, there are pockets in this country, I think more in research settings, but in Japan and parts of Scandinavia, they are using robots for care, uh, actually providing care, companion robots who will, um, can be pets, can be people-type robots uh, who can talk to you, be funny, listen to you, and adapt to, to your needs. Um, and I saw something recently that they're also feeding robots who can actually help feed an individual. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, innovation um, in what's available. Right now, it's uh, all on a, um, it's a commercial uh, system. You know, you can get what you can pay for. And uh, then I would say, what next? Does, does that robot, does that care system talk to your practitioner? And I think we don't have a very good primary health care system. We don't have... Uh, bubbles of care where a patient can identify who their primary care is, who their nurse is, who their home health care agency is. It's very much insurance dependent and every year a patient can change their site of care depending on their insurance. So we don't have a very cohesive health care system. But in countries that do, uh, there's a real potential that these robots and uh, technical systems can actually talk to the primary care practice. You know, thinking about those robots, uh, if you guys remember the picture of Harry, and he had that decubitus ulcer, that pressure ulcer, right? Think about it if there was actually a robot. Because in order to prevent that, we all know that you have to reposition the patient every two hours. 
Now think about it. That's pretty much 24-7. You, know, you, you really don't want them to lay on that ulcer for more, a pressure ulcer, more than two hours. Imagine if there was a robot, like you're saying, Dr. Pandya, and it would say, tick, 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 and it changed the patient, or a bed, or a robotic bed that did that for you. Some exist, but they're not really there, but that would be amazing. Uh, one more question to you, Dr. Pandya. Um, shifting gears again, in your clinical practice, did you come across patients who have, who you notice are really isolated and have social isolation. Is that like a problem that you see? And does that affect overall the medical care that you give? And any solutions from age tech that you've seen so far or not yet that have been offered? Social isolation is uh, now a new geriatric syndrome, just isolation, you know, as well as dementia, delirium, uh, risk of falling. That's a this is now recognized as a geriatric condition. Of course, many other people are isolated, but elders are more likely to be isolated, not only in this country, but many countries. In the low middle income countries, there's the fragmentation of the extended family. So nuclear families, migration to cities lead to social isolation in older adults. And that leads, of course, to loneliness. And loneliness is a predisposition for deteriorating health, uh, depression, and even dementia. Mm -hmm. Loneliness is recognized now as a risk factor for dementia. So yes, there are really serious consequences to isolation, and we see that. And what we might see in the clinic is you know, apathy, weight loss, the person is less uh, engaged in their healthcare, not filling their meds, not showing up for appointments. And um, so that really needs to prompt a search as to why, you know, what's happening. So we've kind of stated the problem in Dr. Pandya, you see it clinically in the real world. And I, I wanna go back to the research world again. Dr. Chen, I wanted to ask you, um, how are you incorporating SDOH into some of the applications and algorithms, specifically in the age tech community? Um, right. Um, so first, I would like to say that social determinants of health is not a new concept. Uh, it started a long time ago, people realizing that, you know, the access and quality of medical care can account for about 20% of our health. The other 80% is tied to our physical environment, you know, our social and behavioral factors, you know, smoking, those are lifestyle factors, and also, you know, crime rates, uh, education, food access, so long, um, uh, and so on. Um, the thing is that what I find is that, um, like, just piggyback on Puyang's earlier point, like garbage in, garbage out, data quality is really important. Historically, I think in the machine learning algorithm, uh, because of the lacking of access to so individual level social determinants of uh, health data, uh, it's not really incorporated so much into you know, those models. I think nowadays, uh, SDOH becomes a buzzword is because things are moving from people understanding social determinants of health as um, something impacting our health to the acceptance that delivery systems and payers um, has a bigger role, can do something about it, you know, to have those um, social determinants of health screening tools to collect the data and incorporate them into EHR, and then trying to use them to uh, design those tailored uh, social determinants of health interventions, you know, provide transportation to facilitate the access it, to care, so it, on and so forth. It, it seems that in order for that to happen, like we said, garbage in, garbage out, that's one thing. But also, like, how many of you guys, when you go to one doctor, he has one set of records, and you go to the hospital, they have one set of records. So kind of, I feel like even with SDOH and medical records, it's all fragmented. And Dr. Puyan, if, if you can speak to us about health information and exchange, health fixes, right? Because that's a big topic. Everyone talks about it. You did some research on it. How do we take all this information from everywhere, from me, as a patient and put it in one spot where I can access it. And to follow up, maybe you can talk about if blockchain is also part of the solution or not. So as a matter of fact, the healthcare in the United States is completely frag uh, frag fragmented. So you have different hospitals with different infrastructure, with different technology. So most of the time they are not very compatible. So yeah, there are lots of 
federal, for example, meaningful use program or, or for example, CMS. And there are lots of, uh, for example, activities to encourage hospital to have a certified EHR to be compatible. But, but again, again, uh, so the problem is that they cannot same, they cannot exchange the real time data. So the real time data is very important. So yes, it's, it's completely possible that I, if I want the patient data, for example, today if I send you an email, you just, for example, reply like, for example, a week or for example, in three days, but, but I need real data, so real-time data. Real-time data is important. So that's why we have the project is called Health Information Exchange. So like previously, so what are the traditional ways that you just could your medical records and for example, uh, get it to your doctor? You just have like CD or for example, they mail it or for example, they fax it, right? So now the problem is that now we don't use those traditional way because we need to evolve, right? If we don't evolve, you dissolve. So that's it. We need to do that. So we have lots of HIE projects. So what is HIE? HIE means that there are some methods, there are some, for example, ways, and there are some, uh, for example, a mechanism that try to help different hospitals with different mechanisms, with different infrastructure to, sh to send information and receive it electronically. It's completely electronically. You're saying in between hospitals. Yes, between hospitals. So exchange between hospitals. And also different healthcare organizations, not only hospitals. It can be between hospitals, clinics, and different hospitals. And affiliated and unaffiliated. This is a very key point. So hospitals may want to share information with affiliated ones. But they don't want to share information with unaffiliated. So you're saying even politics gets itself into health information exchange? I'm, I'm sure yes. Uh -huh. I'm sure yes. So sometimes because of competition, maybe you don't want to lose your patient. You don't want to share information. That's funny, but it's true. It's true. So sometimes hospitals don't want to share information because they don't want to lose you. Well, you know, you know, I see Dr. Pandya, and she's shaking her head. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her the mic, and let's see what you feel about this. Um, things are better. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's true anymore that hospitals don't want to lose you. They actually want to kick you out very quickly uh, in two to three days, especially for older adults. You know, you can get part A medical stay in a nursing home after two or three nights of hospital stay. It depends. So uh, I think that's not true anymore because care is being decentralized from hospitals. But uh, we are getting um, information when our patients are admitted to the hospital now because hospitals are at risk of penalties for readmissions, right? Is for heart failure, COPD, complications from orthopedic surgery, et cetera. Uh, there are a few, uh, you know, uh, high uh, risk uh, diagnoses. So they don't want to be at, uh, at financial risk. They don't want to lose their payments. They're also at risk if you get a pressure sore in the hospital or a catheter associated UTI. Uh, so uh, uh, we are getting information. What has helped is we're now being paid uh, with specific billing codes called transitional care codes. TCM, uh, yeah. TCF. Uh, for patients who come out of the hospital, which take uh, more time to evaluate, look at their medications, their records. So these billing codes have helped, uh, and they have kind of changed. So the money has changed the system. Um, so that They realigned the incentives, you're saying, they the have, incentives. Uh, yes, and they've incentivized uh, health systems. It's complex. The patient has to be contacted within 48 hours of discharge. So you have to know that they were in the hospital. Um, but we're getting faxes. Uh, then we do a face-to-face -face visit. And then at the end of the month, all the care gets billed. But I do have a problem with uh, this checklist. You know, checking a list doesn't mean you did anything for the patient. You just checked a list. Okay, that's it. And unfortunately, even social determinants of health, as important as they are, in some electronic health records, you just see them checked. So, so what? Um, it wasn't and, actually done. Yeah. And the other, my other uh, really uh, a big complaint is all the electronic health records and ch time of charting that nurses have to spend. And physicians, for one hour of medical care, they spend two hours on charting. That is not medical care. That's just charting. And that has led to burnout and loss of health professionals. 
But you know, so nurses have to do a tremendous amount of charting, and the patient comes out with 18 pages of patient education and checklists. That and nobody stuff. ever reads. Uh, that uh, the patient doesn't read. We don't have time to read that. We need the information. What happened to you? What was your test result? What was your urine culture? What was your white blood count? Right. So now that we had a very nice back and forth between Dr. Pandya and Dr. Poyan that was very interesting and, and enlightening. Dr. Chen, what are your thoughts on this? You want to be the tiebreaker? Yeah, so uh, like Dr. Pandya said, um, I agree one of the key challenges of uh, individual level social determinants, uh, why it was not really you know, uh, integrated in uh, EHR and then to play its, the role it should be playing, um, is that you know, there's a lack of standards in screening and collecting SDOH. Uh, across different providers, across different healthcare organizations. So how to build a, uh, like flow sheets uh, into the EHR, it does not increase the burden of the nurses. Uh, it doesn't cause the concern of the patients, like the privacy concerns and data breach concerns. And another thing I wanted to add to Dr. Puyang's uh, discussion about the barriers of uh, health information exchange and the interoperability, interoperability is also you know, um, the stakeholders concern about privacy and data breach. Right. Um, you know, data breach always occur in the weakest link. So that's why, you know, the relatively larger hospital, they are not that willing to exchange with those smaller hospitals because they know once the data leaves their organization, it increases the probability of being breached. And once it's breached, then, you know, the lawsuits, millions of dollars, you know, uh, those uh, kind of uh, compensation. So it's a big concern. A data breach should not mean lack of data and lack of care, because care suffers when information isn't communicated. I mean, yes, Tuesday I, I needed a very important result from an imaging center. They said, we can't give it to you without the patient's permission. The well, good old HIPAA. HIPAA. So I'm working with the patient. I know the referring physician. Okay, don't send it to me. Send it to the referring physician. Think about how much time was wasted. And HIPAA does not mean you shield the information from the next site of care, because you're no longer right. responsible for the patient. The next team has to have that information. That's a very good point. As, as a physician, I used to come across that all the time, and really, it was frustrating, because you need to clear someone for surgery. It's tomorrow. You need the records, and you can't get it. Think about that. Dr. Chen? Yeah, um, so it's really important for the hospitals and healthcare organizations to ramp up their IT security. So what we found is that by uh, implementing the multi-factor authentication can really reduce the risk of being breached. Yeah. Wonderful. Now we have time for two more questions only. Um, and, you know, we're talking about healthcare, but it's also important to think about well, the doctors, the technologists, the folks who are, are working in the, in the present, where, what was our education to them when they were students? And so I know all of us are involved, but Dr. Pandey, I'd like to direct it from a medical school perspective. How, in an age tech, what kind of fancy technologies are we implementing to our med students to get them ready for the future? Quite a lot, actually. So that's uh, very heartening. And you know, the rest of us are struggling to keep up with it. <laughs> right. But we, we do have a lot of uh, uh, platforms available. So our second year medical students, for instance, when they're learning about different health you know, disorders, body systems, part of their training, in addition to small groups, is a patient simulation. So we now have high fidelity mannequins where you can simulate a case, you know, the patient passed out or their blood sugar is 500, what do you do now? And the outcome depends on what they do and they frequently kill the patient, but at least it's a mannequin, you know. So, um, so we have patient simulation. We also uh, have now uh, piloted uh, the use of a program called Embodied Labs. So this is immersive learning where the, uh, the learner uh, goes into a case and video, they have headphones, they're in a 3D setting, they're experiencing the same as the patient with dementia, a patient with Parkinsonism, so different scenarios. So the students learn uh, from a, almost a real life point of view what it's like to be there. And in our HRSA grant, in our geriatrics workforce grant, 
we are piloting the 4M framework. So I must say something about that. So this is an evidence-based framework to improve elder care. Uh, and it's based on four pillars, four M's, uh, matters most, medication, mentation, and mobility. So if you capture all the key areas that affect an older person in this manner, you really can't go wrong. You will take care of that person, you know, and at least provide them with what they need. So what we have done is um, uh, we're releasing a, a virtual reality case that embodies these four ends. It traces the journey of a patient who uh, fell and had a fracture, and then uh, M, fermentation, got delirious in the hospital for multiple reasons. Um, medications were uh, instrumental in causing her fall, and then what mattered most was her living situation and... Uh, uh, you know, what she decided to do with, you know, uh, what her decisions were regarding her ongoing care. So this 4M framework is now um, something that many health systems are employing uh, to improve elder care. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this last question because to all of us here, students are very dear to our hearts. And we have some students here with us. You guys are the future. And a lot of the times we all, you know, I know I, I stand on the shoulder of giants, right? And they help me understand and see. And we have such giants here with us today. And so I wanted to ask each of you in 30 seconds or so as we wrap up, what words of wisdom and advice do you have for the students here? Whether it's practical, studies, goal, vision, what did you find was helped you become knowledgeable and successful? Uh, Dr. Puyan. My, my response is going to be from the perspective of IT guy. So maybe it's different from, uh -huh. for example, physician. So my uh, perspective is that so in, in the next decade or, for example, in, uh, in for the next generation of physicians, so maybe we cannot say that, for example, AI is going to replace uh, physicians completely. Maybe in future, in 50 years, yes. But in the next decade, I don't think so because we are still we need to have physicians. But the thing is that I think, I, I still believe that, so we need to have completely, we need to change the curriculum for, for example, physicians. We need to have some AI-based uh, skills for them. At least they need to understand that black box. At least they need to understand, trust it, right? So the only people cannot take full advantage of AI in future is that those people can, that refuse to use AI in their job regardless of this is healthcare or anything. So that's why my, my suggestion for everyone, even in my class, I always say that, try to keep abreast of the latest, uh, for example, technology, especially in AI, because AI is future, there is no back. There is no going back, it's impossible. So robotic is in future. So the machine learning is in future. So that's why I want to tell all the students to keep abreast of this buzzword. Follow people on Twitter. There are lots of brilliant people on Twitter. They just have, and companies, and um, they just uh, for example, share information about AI and latest technology in healthcare. So these are some of my thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Puyan. Dr. Pandya. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but there's no going back. And I am really, uh, even at the stage of my life, I've been a clinician for almost 35 years, but I'm avidly trying to learn about technology. There is no going back. I think it can reduce errors. It can uh, reduce the time we waste in getting things done. It can provide us timely information uh, to make the right decisions. Uh, and But I, I would say to students, at least my medical students and health profession students, that practice high-tech but high-touch medicine. Beautiful. Dr. Chen. Yeah, so I would say that uh, it's really important to develop a holistic view towards the healthcare system. Because right now, uh, our healthcare system is more like a sick care system. Only when people get sick, you know, they get the care they needed. But how do we keep 
people healthy. So I think as a student, um, it's really important to understand the different stakeholders because sometimes they even have conflicting objectives. So I find that my background in public policy and consulting really helped me to understand all the you know different things going on, the fragmented healthcare system on how to navigate through the whole system. Uh, and also I think our FIU business program curriculums take all this into account. Our healthcare MBA program, our MS HEARS program really, you know, have offered all this um, different perspective to look at the whole holistic way of the healthcare system. And finally, keep your passion and come to events like this to stay updated about the latest trend and keep inspired. Beautiful. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll add from my end, I was driving with my son Avraham today. Avraham, you want to get up and say hi? Just wave your hand. <laughs> Put him on the spot. So we were driving and I was talking to him and I said, look, in life, you just got to show up. Just show up. Just go for it. Get out of your comfort zone. So I see some students here today. Amazing. When I was doing what you're doing, like in school, I didn't even think about coming any of these events. But can you imagine how much knowledge I could have gained? And it's all about, the, it's not about, oh, I want to make money. I want to, no. What value do you bring to the marketplace? And you can bring value to the marketplace. The more knowledgeable, the more valuable you are, the more value you will receive from the marketplace as well. Right? So that's my advice to you. And saying that, South Florida Hymns actually has a scholarship for students. Um, we, we gave it out. Uh, Kendall just reminded me. And we gave that out, I believe, the last time at our golf outing. And it works with students. If anyone's interested, go to our website, reach out to the Hymns family, and we'd love to see you succeed and grow and sit here in the future as experts. Thank you, everybody. This was a great time. Thanks to our beautiful and wonderful speakers. Thank you so much. And also, oh, yes, and, and yes, we did actually, I forgot. Thank you, Grant. Sveta. I know that when we were talking, you, you had a question that you asked me, and I didn't know the answer to it. And I said, maybe Dr. Pandya would know, or someone of the panelists. Let me give you the mic. Just ask this, because I thought it was an interesting point. And then we'll ask other folks as well who have questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was such an enriching uh, discussion. I had so many questions to ask each one of you, but I think as you know we have limited time uh, so let me just do a two-part question uh, actually one question to you dr. Chan and one question to you dr. Pandya we spoke about social determinants of health and I was thinking back in pr my practice uh, John Hopkins has released this you know list of algorithms to do predictions one to the other and everything uh, and to talk about SDOH how do we really try and measure social determinants of health in a poor, underserved community? And I'm talking about older adults here, you know, and then make all those pred predictions with this advanced technology which we are looking at. So that's one to you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Pandya, when I was listening to you about CGM, um, and of course, it's one of these, you know, uh, upcoming technologies. And it, it is, it has worked a lot. Like I've looked into the research, people love it. Uh, I'm talking again from an older person's perspective. I mean, for me, it's difficult to even switch from Windows to Mac. So someone who is, you know, using pins and needles for 20 years, and suddenly you tell them that, no, you don't use this, but you use this, this is more useful. And for that person to put something on the arm, you know, whole day, whole night, and you know, how do we explain things are different, are going to be different for them? So that is one question to you, Dr. Pandya, thank you. I have a quick answer, so um, uh, continuous glucose monitors, uh, uh, what has helped and is t the television. All right, TV ads have helped because patients are familiar. Can I have a freestyle? No, I want a freestyle Libra too. Oh, okay. Uh, so no, Dexcom G6. Yeah. So TV has helped uh, to uh, promote, uh, in enhance the knowledge. But so continuous glucose monitors for older patients—they reduce the need for finger sticks. You wear a sensor, 
uh, that is a very fine plastic catheter, sits in your skin depending 10 days or 14 days depending on the system. But it has changed the life of people with diabetes because they don't have to poke their fingers to check blood sugars maybe two to five times a day even. It has changed their life. It has alarms, so even when they're sleeping, they know their blood sugar is too high or too low. It shows trends. Um, and it has helped people change lifestyles because they see, oh, uh, Olive Garden wasn't such a good idea. Uh, oh, <laughs> what did that Krispy Kreme donut do to my blood sugar? Or uh, I had too much rice today. Uh, so it has changed lifestyles. What does activity do? It's given them real-time feedback. And the data, there's more data, Dr. Tewari, in type 1 diabetes patients that it has reduced hospitalizations, uh, intensive care hospitalizations for diabetic ketoacidosis. But there is new data coming out that it has improved outcomes for older adults with type 2. And just this week, Tuesday, I had an 80-year-old in my clinic who has multiple complications from diabetes. And I'm trying to get her a continuous glucose monitor. The insurance is a hassle. Um, but I had some sample sensors in the clinic. So we said, give us your cell phone. And she was pretty good with her cell phone, settings, apps. So I had the medical student help me because I was trying to see another patient. They got the app on her phone. I had a free sensor. So I taught her how to apply the sensor. We applied the sensor to her skin. And there were several hoops to go through, you know, settings. But she was really great and because she knew her phone. And uh, in about 20 minutes, we had several blood sugars without a single finger stick. So she went home with a continuous glucose monitor. It was really exciting that it, it can be done, and older people are adopting this technology. They need support. They need few frequent visits in the beginning to apply sensors. Things go wrong. A sensor fell off. But they love it, and we're now getting remote access to their data. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, I think that's a really great question about measuring the effectiveness of social determinants of health. Um, so right now, a lot of the data were available at the area level. For example, there is a social vulnerability index um, at you know county zip level, uh, and also there is American Community Survey provides you know area level SDOH. But what we found is that if we really want to improve the accuracy of the predictive modeling, we need the individual level SDOH. So only by that we can feed into the algorithm and then stratify patients or like stratify the population into different you know risks, and then we can do some to you know to have the tailored intervention um, take transportation as an example for those who need access need a ride to their doctor's appointment if the patient is completely ambulatory you know um, they don't have some special treatments or needs then uh, providers can partner with those ride sharing companies like uh, Lyft, Uber to provide low cost options. But if the patient has some special, you know, uh, like needs special equipment like wheelchairs, then maybe, you know, the non emergency medical transportation would be more uh, suitable. So you see, we can kind of, if we have that individual level as DOH, it's going to be able to help us to control those upstream social risks and then to save the downstream costs. But then, like I said, the challenge is that there's a lack of standards in collecting and screening such individual level as DOH. Thank you. We have time for one more question. There you go. Arahamchik, can you please give the microphone to the gentleman in the back? So thank you. I'm I'm uh, Dr. Hemang Subramanian. I'm Puyan and Dr. Chen's uh, uh, Dr. Min Chen's colleague. I had a question for doc both Eric and f to Dr. Naushira about uh, in what well, this field of geriatrics that looks at extending human lifespan, and there seems to be recent research that looks at these tools that can extend the human lifespan beyond what has been. Uh, this, the concepts about biological age, physical age, and things like that. Could you uh, uh, tell us what's the state of the art and and uh, how this applies to uh, 
what you guys are actually doing either with i connect or in your research dr nosh you know Very good question. How many how many uh, Star Trek fans do we have? Anybody watch? Yes, I I, I love it. Right, uh, and and you guys know the fusion of man and machine, like the Borgs. That's going to be the future. That's how the lifespan. Again, I'm talking about years from now. Probably Avraham's great grandchildren will see that. But there will be that fusion of man and machine. And therefore, hey, your liver is failing, don't worry about it. We got a machine for that. Hey, your heart's not pumping, and we already have, right? We got a heart for that. And that will extend. And not only that, but like Neuralink. Look what Elon Musk and other companies that are actually doing. I could sit here and send a message to Dr. Chen, like, hey, Dr. Chen, do you have a class after this? And, and you guys won't even know it. And da -da -da. that's what Neuralink is working on, sending these messages. That's where we're going to be, in the fusion of man and machine. Fun times. Dr. Pandya. Um. I'm a little behind that, but... <laughs> um, still in the present. I, I agree. Uh, we should be. I'm still here. <laughs> uh, but I, I think to, um, to your question, uh, lifespan has gone, uh, uh, is longer as we move forward uh, through time. It has increased. And part of it is infection prevention, clean water, antibiotics, even soap. Okay, so lifespan is increasing, but what we now have is um, the non-infectious chronic conditions that are uh, leading to shortened lifespan. So it still comes down to the basics. Control your blood pressure from now, today. <laughs> control your blood pressure, control your weight. Uh, monitor, uh, um, control your blood glucose, even if you have diabetes. Uh, get help so it's adequately controlled, um, adequate exercise. I think all those things reduce the um, probability of long-term downstream cardiovascular complications, which are really the commonest you know, cause of uh, mortality. Also, uh, simple things like Mediterranean diet, exercise. And you know the study of centenarians the ones who lived longest, they didn't live longest because they had less cancer or, s or something, but they did have very healthy diets. They exercised. Um, their food was very healthy. Um, they were socially connected. They were not alone. They had long-time friendships, so social, spiritual, community connections. Those people lived the longest. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, just to quickly add, there's a startup company uh, in San Diego called Human Longevity Inc. HDI, uh, HLI. So it's uh, building the largest human genome phenotypes. So what that means is that uh, once it has like the largest uh, human genotype and uh, genomes uh, phenotypes collected, and then it's going to be able to tell you, you know, whether you have uh, BRCA1, BRCA gene, uh, genes that's going to have a higher probability of breast cancer, or another person may, you know, uh, doesn't have such cancer genes but may have have a higher probability of heart attack. So by knowing this information, then you're able to, it's going to guide you to you know, change your lifestyle and live a longer life. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to hand over the mic to the HIMSS team, who worked tirelessly and effortlessly, really putting in so much time. First of all, let's give the whole HIMSS team a round of applause. Let's also thank FIU, you know, all of this, it takes time, energy, resources to put this together. Really, thank you to the FIU team for setting this up and helping us out. And Grant, for the closing remarks, sir, I would like to hand you the mic. We just have one request, because you have stayed attentive for the last couple of hours. And what we'd like to do, we have not come together as a group physically because of the pandemic and things of that nature. But we haven't done this in a long time. I would like all of you to come to the front. We're going to take a group picture. We want to show our community how, first of all, how important AIDS tech really is. I don't know anyone here not dealing with an elderly person within their care, within their family, that they, they have to work with. I know I had to work with my grandmother for, for years before she passed on. Anybody? Who's dealing with an elderly person? 
Yes. This is very, very, very important. So if you don't mind, come on up to the front. We're going to have Mr. Jim take a picture, and we're going to post this and post it again and again and again on our social media feeds. Thank you again for a great panel, great panel discussion. Thank you.